and welcome to Always Take Notes. We are thrilled to announce the publication of Always Take Notes, advice from some of the world's greatest writers. The book, edited by the two of us, features contributions from almost 100 past guests on the podcast. It's a distillation of the wit and wisdom we've heard over the past six years. The book offers, we think, frank and entertaining guidance on writing in particular and living a creative life in general. It answers questions such as, where do the best ideas come from? How do you stay motivated? What does it take to become a published author? And how do you actually make money from your writing? Published by Ithaca Press, Always Take Notes, advice from some of the world's greatest writers is available now in all good bookshops. We hope you enjoy reading it. Hello and welcome to Always Take Notes. In this episode, Rachel and myself spoke with Juliet Maybe, the publisher at One World. We spoke to Juliet about winning three Booker Prizes since 2015, her early experience setting up One World after university, and the role of independents versus large corporate publishers. It's a great episode and we hope you enjoy it. Welcome, Juliet, to Always Take Notes. It's fantastic to have you on the show. Could we start with your third Booker Prize win last year for Profit Song by Paul Lynch? You've said in interviews that it was a different experience to winning in the past, that there was more expectation. Could you explain why that is and and why the experience was was different for you? When we were shortlisted in 2015 with Marlon James' A Brief History of Seven Killings, it was definitely not the favourite to win. It was often fourth or fifth out of the six on the short list. So we, we, I, I told him he wasn't going to win because I think you don't want to go in with high expectations to be disappointed. And we all went in, enjoyed the dinner and were absolutely shocked to our back teeth to, to win. And obviously an amazing experience, but we were, we were very relaxed about it because we, you know, the bookies all thought a little life was going to win. Worcester thought little life was going to win. The whole world thought little life was going to win. And, you know, obviously a brilliant book. So it was it was a huge surprise, but a, a sort of a very relaxing lead up to it because, you know, all the, the events that you do the week leading up to the Booker Prize were thoroughly enjoyable, networking, the authors got to know each other. So the following year, we have shortlisted again in 2016 with Paul Beatty's The Sellout. And we we thought it a little bit of an outlier. It's a very unusual book. It's a, an American who'd never won the prize before and... We thought it was highly unlikely that a small independent would win two years running, both with black men, with the first American, and Deborah Levy was expected to win. So we went into the dinner very relaxed, not expecting to win, had a thoroughly enjoyable week of events. And it was very different with the Profit Song because several of the bookies thought it could win. Um, It was the favorite in many of their publications. And the author, it was his fifth novel, he had very high expectations at the beginning of his career, which sadly didn't meet his expectations or, or, or anyone else's really. And so for him, it was incredibly important to win a prize like the Booker, which is really one of the preeminent prizes for um, literature, which you know every author writing in English wants to win. And as a result, it was very nerve wracking the, the events were quite stressful, but the dinner b- became, I mean, it, it, it gave me an idea of, of how it was like for perhaps some of, the, some of the authors at our previous dinners, which we hadn't been nervous at, because I think, you, you know, you, you, you start the evening at about six o'clock and they don't make the announcement till 10 to 10 or quarter to 10. And it's a very long time to wait. Anyway, I did think it had a good chance of winning, but I didn't tell the author that. But I did think it had a very good chance of winning. But, you know, he was it was obviously meant such a lot to him. Financially, reputation, his career, his life. So, yeah, it was stressful for all of us, I think. But, you know, massive for him. I mean, it's, it's fantastic for him. We've had various authors on the podcast, including Marlon James, talk about what a uh a sort of titanic and life-changing experience winning the book it is from an author's perspective. But we were wondering from a publisher's perspective, like what what does it mean? How does it change things? I mean, we get the sense you have to print a lot more books and sell a lot of translation rights. But from you know, from your side of the the desk, how did that win both the first and and the second and third change things for you? For Marlon James, obviously we'd never done this before and all six, or if there's more than one from one publisher, all sort of five or six publishers, 
have to prepare the text and cover of the book as if they're going to win. So we send to the printers the week before all the files as if you're going to win. And only one of them gets to print those files. So it's quite a strange experience. So yeah, with Marlon, he was already in paperback by the time we got to the award ceremony. And we printed something like 170,000 copies that night. And also printed our Indian and Australian distributors also printed local editions the same night. So it was quite incredible. Our full production guy had to stay in the office and get it all sorted and then join the party later. For Paul, obviously, we, we knew a little bit of what to expect for Paul Basic because we'd done it the year before. And the only thing we had to change was that they, if you're printing a paperback in that situation, the printers are, we, we use Clay's, which is a fantastic printer. And they guarantee to have the books in the shops by Thursday morning, which is astonishing. For they're, they're given the information Monday night, late Monday night, and they, they print the books, bind them, and ship them so that they're in the shops by Thursday morning. And for Paul Beatty, they said if we want to keep the flaps on his paperback, which he had at the time, it would take two weeks. But if we took the flaps off, they could meet the Thursday morning deadline, which they did. For the profit song, it's in hardback. So we didn't really know what to expect in terms of the print run or timing. And Clay's were fantastic. They The, the dinner was a little earlier. The award ceremony was on the Sunday. They had the books in the shops by Friday, which for hardback, I don't know if anyone's tried to print hardback because they normally take two weeks. And I still don't know how they managed to do that. It was phenomenal. And I think they had the entire print run out by the Monday. So we printed 260,000 in about three different printings because we thought we were being very ambitious printing. The, the first print run was about 140,000 and we had to print twice more within a fortnight. So we printed both an export paperback for Ireland, Australia and India and the rest of the world and a hardback for the UK. And yeah, it's, it's it was slightly different, but we'd, we'd kind of been through that process before. So not too much of a surprise. And again, authors have spoken to us about how winning a prize changes things like their advances subsequently and the sort of general attitude towards their work. As a publisher, do you find as well that agents are more ready to submit work to you, that authors really talk about wanting to work with you as an editor? I'm not sure I noticed it so much with the first two because we were still very new to fiction. We'd only started our fictionists in 2009. So by the time we won with Paul Beatty, it was only seven years later. But I've definitely noticed it this year that it does seem to have made a difference. Although we're we're in a strange place anyway, not just us, but all fiction editors in the fact that there seems to be an avalanche of manuscripts coming at all of us. So whether some of that is because we won the booker and some of that's because there's just a lot being sent out at the moment, it's quite hard to tell. But I think it has made... I think the third one seems a bit ridiculous. So I think it has made a little bit of a difference. But I think two is probably lucky. Three gets a bit odd, I think. We'll come back to the the sort of recent um, experiences you had in due course. But we wanted to roll back now to your early life and your initial interest in books. And we saw that you, you believe that illicit reading by moonlight when you were at boarding school may have damaged your eyesight. Could you take us back to that period of your life? Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, at boarding school, they have this extraordinary thing and they turn the lights out at something ridiculous like half past six. So I used to sit on the windowsill and read by moonlight. And I'm I'm fairly sure it has damaged my eyes. I think a lot of readers have wear glasses and I think there's not that much of a surprise, but I've always loved reading. I used to, I used to take books to the toilet and turn the light on and put a towel at the bottom so that anyone checking in the evening wouldn't see the light on but yeah I mean I was horrendous I used to I used to read till sort of one in the morning sometimes or later but yeah I've, I've always loved reading my mother used to take me to the libraries all the time when I was little and she also let me buy a lot of books I had to build a, a bookcase over the whole of my bedroom wall once because I had too many books so I've always been a little bit of a collector and you've mentioned in other interviews Charles Dickens being a particular point of reference for you when you were growing up what was it about his work that appealed to you? probably like most people, I didn't read Charles Dickens till I was in sort of secondary school. And I was just so shocked by the way he, I mean, I was interested in the fact that he wrote them in a serial form, but I was shocked at the social issues he was able to expose to a reading public. Because some people feel that fiction shouldn't be worthy 
and that it's almost a anti-literary to make your fiction worthy to, to really cover important issues which I love to do in my list and many of our authors do cover a variety of issues from sort of obviously racism like Paul Beatty and you know the slave trade like like Marlon James and you know terrible governments like Paul Lynch but I, I actually think fiction is a very good way of of discussing issues which can be quite polemical because in a, in a novel you can show them from both sides at the same time. You can have different characters espousing different sides of an argument or, or an issue. And I think it makes it much easier to, for people to think about things and to empathize with the characters in the novel and therefore understand what people might be going through. But I think Dickens was amazing in the way he, the way he talked about poverty and what happens to people, you know, going to the poor house and and that you can get trapped into poverty because you sometimes they keep you there till you can pay off a debt, which obviously is not a terribly good solution if you need to pay off a debt. And and the schooling system, of course, it's extraordinary the fact that, that I mean, obviously our, our society's moved on a lot, but I think people can still see the 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 problems that he's trying to show. And I think it's very brave to do that, especially when, you know, at the time he was trying to earn money from writing. And I think some of his views can't have been particularly welcome in political circles, but my understanding is that things like Oliver Twist actually changed public opinion towards poverty and enabled the MPs to change the poor laws as a result because they can only change laws when public opinion sort of swings that way. And I, I understand that he had a terrific impact on that. And I think that's amazing that fiction could do that because a lot of people look at fiction as if it's sort of, the lighter side. Non-fiction is a serious, meaty thing, and fiction is the lighter side. And actually, the research shows that reading fiction is incredibly important for fostering empathy, not just in children, but in adults as well. And I, I think it's these sorts of books that can do it. In terms of your, your pre-One World existence, we saw that you'd done a variety of eclectic jobs, so working in a restaurant, a circus, a farm, a kibbutz, going to agricultural college, and then going to study cultural anthropology at university. Could you tell us you know, about your, your young adult life and how that, that all worked out? <laughs> well, I, I, I didn't really... Um, my first job was washing up in a wine bar. I was too young to be allowed to serve alcohol because I was 17 and I'd just finished my A-levels and I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do. And I have to say, it teaches you a lot about human nature and the importance of networking and the importance of working fast because you can be a very slow washer-upper until someone shows you how to do it quickly. But um, I, I, don't, I don't think I really knew what I was capable of or where my interests lay. So I moved on from that to serving food in the pub which my mother got me offered, volunteered me for that because they needed help and she knew the people. And then I went, I saw an advert for, I was always very keen on horses. I saw an advert for, for, for some reason, for a groom in a circus, which sounded interesting. So I applied for it. And obviously they were delighted to have anybody with any horse experience applying. So I got the job straight away. And I spent, I think about five months traveling around the south of Britain and through the middle of London, we were at Peckham as, and Enfield as well, looking after horses, helping with training camels. I had a llama to look after. I had to do a little horse act. I could stand on a horse, uh, country around a ring, not, not terribly well. I was supposed to be a member of the audience, so I wasn't. A, they tried to pull me off before I could show my real talent, I think. But it was great. It was really interesting. And what, what really interested me about that particular job was that it was a community of interest, you know, that it is an actual community in its own right. And it's a led society and it has its own rules and hierarchies and expectations. So I just found it absolutely fascinating, you know, between the, the owners, the artists and the general workers of which I was one. I think I was the only one without a GBH, but apart from that, and they got rid of all sorts of bizarre things like translate for the Czechoslovakian high wire cyclists who fell off and broke broke something and I had to go to the hospital and translate for them. So all sorts of bizarre things. And when you're only 18, that's that's quite interesting. It's a quick learning curve. Was it that interest in in a wide variety of people that led you to study social anthropology? Definitely. I mean, I think, um, I mean, at the time, I'd been told at school I was going to be a writer. So at the time, I kept a diary and Everyone in the circus was terrified that I was going to write this huge expose, which I never did, obviously. But I was also interested in agriculture and farming and the way people lived and the way 
the way the countryside was changing and rural life was changing. And I'd read a lot of fiction, you know, set in the sort of Victorian era and earlier. And obviously that era was passing very fast. So I then applied to Agricultural College to do a, a one-year course, which meant that I had to go to work on a farm first. So I did that and was obsessed with becoming a shepherdess, which obviously I never did. And then I went to work on a kibbutz in Israel, which I thought was going to be about looking after sheep, but I was sent down to the very south of Israel. So it was all date palms, so fertilizing date palms and picking peppers and tomatoes and basically that kind of thing. So a very interesting life, I would say. And then a friend of my mother's insisted that I, I was very late to be applying to university and I really had better get on with it. And I'd had four gap years and I think they felt that was really a couple of years too much. So I applied to Edinburgh University and I did English anthropology, which I absolutely loved. Could you then tell us about the origin story of One World? We saw that you and your husband and co-founder Noveen had met at university and then that you were in Cyprus and that it, it kind of came from there. Take us back to, you know, the beginning of, of it all. Yes, it's a, it's a slightly strange story because we'd been talking in Edinburgh. We, My husband did accountancy after his economics degree, so we had to stay in Edinburgh a few extra years for him to qualify. And a lot of his friends were applying for jobs in places like Paris and Rome to, to have a little bit of extra in such experience. And you had to speak that language fluently to go to one of those countries. And so we were limited if we wanted to go abroad for a change of scene to English speaking, using British accountancy rules. So basically ex-colonial countries. So Cyprus seemed the the nearest and the most obvious choice. So we we set off for Cyprus and along the way we we were chatting about setting up a publishing company, which seems really crazy because if you're setting up a publishing company, you'd think you'd stay in London, wouldn't you, or something like that. But anyway, we, we, we went there, and he didn't particularly like accountancy, which is fairly common for accountants. And I didn't really like getting stuck at home with two children, which by then were a year or two and a half. So we stuck it for a year, and at that point, we both pretty much threw in the towel and said, we'll start up this publishing company. And the first question we had was, where do you buy bubble wrap? because we kind of figured we were going to end up with all these books in our living room that we needed to send out. So we luckily soon disabused ourselves of that idea and found a distributor with a warehouse and a rec force, which was Element Books. So we talked to them about the kind of books we wanted to do. And our idea at the time was to, having left university quite recently and both of us having interests beyond the subjects we'd studied, like I, I'd got very interested in psychology and sociology and my husband had got very interested in world religions and philosophy. And we felt that there was, in those days, there was no internet. So there was no Google and you couldn't look up anything. There's no Wikipedia. And it was very difficult to self-study. You could join Open University or you can do an evening course at a local FE college, but there were very few books available written authoritatively, but for a general audience. So that was very much what we had in mind to publish nonfiction by academics and experts, but for a general reader. And so we started, you know, telling people that this is what we wanted to do. And we published our first books in 1986. And that's what we did solidly right up until we started The Fictionalist in 2009. How did you sort of find your your feet and your style as an editor at that point? Um I've seen in interviews recently you described yourself as more of a midwife, but early on when you were persuading academics to write for a more general audience, especially in a sphere that people hadn't really encountered before, this style of writing hadn't really been done before, how did you go about sort of achieving that? Was it a bit more heavy-handed editing early on? Oh, definitely. I mean, the first problem was trying to persuade academics to write for a general audience because some of them either aren't allowed to or don't really have that skill. So it's definitely a lot lot more editing. I think it's much more common now. And I think many academics, not so much in the social sciences, but in across a lot of areas like history and popular science, politics, they're very aware of the importance of reaching a broader audience now. And I think they have developed those skills or more of them have developed those skills. But in those days, yes, it was a lot of quite heavy line editing, even structural editing. I mean, you know, some academics, I'm, I'm just, I'm really thinking of one, 
didn't actually know how to structure a paragraph, let alone a chapter or a book. So it was literally cutting up bits of paper on the floor, sticking them against the cellar tape. And, you know, the computers were only just coming in then. And we, and fax had just come in, but not, obviously not in, not, not email. So it was quite a slow process as well. Without the distractions of email, you had more time to really focus on, on the text, I think. But yes, it was a lot heavier editing, I would say. But still with the same intention was to make the book the best it could be. But while staying on the author's side, because you don't want to be heavy handed with the author to the point where they don't feel it's their own work or where they obviously feel traumatized by the experience. It's a, it's a, it can, sometimes it's a gentle nudge, but a, quite a consistent gen, gentle nudge. But yeah, I think that the editor's role is interesting because you're, you're both a, a sort of a midwife of the, of the text itself, but you're also a supporter, an encourager, confidence builder, a champion in the publishing company itself. You know, you have many, many different roles. It's a, a rule of the podcast that we ask about money and how it works. So with, with One World, how were you able to, to kind of get it off the ground financially? And at what stage did it start turning a profit and things like that? Yeah, it was quite slow. Basically, I had some family shares and I sold them to set up One World. And we were able to that gave us enough of a nest egg to get going. And then we were quite modest. I mean, in this day and age, I think you can get funding and maybe we could have done, but we didn't. But in this day and age, you can get funding. You can go around to visit agents, which we weren't doing at the time. We didn't really work with agents particularly. So we we tended to fund each year by the previous year's income and fairly modest. I mean, some years we would publish six books, 10 books, 12 books. And I think we, we got to the point where we sort of, we, you know, we're doing 25 books a year. That's maximum we can manage. I can't imagine doing more and also maintain the quality of what you're doing. So we were fairly careful to to expand relatively slowly. And even now, we're probably only publishing 60 to 70 new books a year. So it's still fairly focused on quality over quantity, I would say. How many people are on your team now? I think all of us together range between about 23 and 25. And of those... Quite a few of them are part time. They often they have parental responsibilities or other interests. So quite a few people are three or four days a week. So, but altogether, it's about twenty five of us at at full stretch. And post Cyprus, you were then in Oxford for a while before moving to London. Is that right? Yeah. So we we moved back to to Oxford in nineteen eighty eight, and we didn't move to London until two thousand eleven. So we were there. For a fairly fairly long time, and it seemed a good base for us from the point of view that a lot of authors we wanted to work with were academics. Oxford's obviously a very academic area. The disadvantage we had was that being neither of us coming from a publishing background, we were quite cut off from a publishing environment because the publishers in Oxford are largely academic or journal publishers. So we had that disadvantage that it was hard to get staff with the sort of a trade experience that we needed, not just in editing, but also in sales and marketing and publicity. And so eventually we decided we'd have to make the move to London. And I think we we left Oxford, I think, with 12 staff and we've just more than doubled in size now. You sent us um, copies of one of the books you published, Bipolar, The Ultimate Guide. Could you tell us a little bit about how that project came into being and, and why you wanted to do it? What really attracted to me to that, so I, I got a, an open submission from the two authors, their cousins, and they come from a family which has, because bipolar can be genetic, so they come from a family where several family members suffer from bipolar. What they really, their ambition was to publish a book that would tell somebody who's newly diagnosed or a relative or friend or colleague of someone newly diagnosed what, everything they might want to know. It's almost like a a question and answer book. So they wanted to, anything you might want to know, you know, what happens if you're sectioned? What ha- what are the drugs? What what can you do to support someone in that situation? And I just thought that was such an amazingly helpful, useful book to produce. And so they, they, they sent us in some, I, I asked for some sample writing and then we went to contract. They finished the first draft of the manuscript and we sent it out. We'd already published I'd, I'd, I'd set up a series called Coping With, which is a, a psychological approach to various illnesses. And one of them was bipolar disorder. So I sent 
their draft manuscripts for a, for a report for, to the author of that book. And he was gave some very useful feedback and was you know, very enthusiastic about it. So they did some edits and they, they did the, the final manuscript. We went through a lot of editing, copy editing, etc. And also we had to add things like American resources and Australian resources as well as British. And uh, just to make it as helpful as we could for as many people as possible. There's obviously a slight challenge between American and British health systems and terminology. So that had to be taken into account. And we were very lucky to have a forward from Paul Abbott, who they were in touch with, and an endorsement from Stephen Fry's sister, because Stephen Fry also suffers from bipolar disorder. And it's been in print ever since. So it published in 2008. And we did a revised edition in 2019, which itself has been reprinted about three or four times. So it's obviously found its use. We were also fortunate that the Bipolar Foundation used it as a first book to give people who signed up to the foundation suffering from bipolar. So it's been, I think, a very useful book. And I really enjoyed working on it. And the two authors are fantastic. And they've had challenges of their own, obviously, with their relatives and and their own health. But I think it's been a very successful book. Just touching on on that and what you said earlier, so was that a process that happened entirely exterior to traditional literary agents, the commissioning of that book? Uh, that I think we just started. Originally, we'd come up with a book idea and then try to track down an author to do it. But we also took open submissions on our website and that one came direct to us. But around 2004 or 5, we we'd met enough agents through contacting an author and then we'd get to the contract stage, having decided what we wanted them to do. And they'd say, oh, and my agent needs to do the contract. So we'd begun to meet agents in that sort of way for, for a little while. And it really wasn't till about 2005 that we started actually going around agents to tell them who we were and what we were doing. So we were quite, a lot of people know us because of things like the fiction we do. And agents in particular pricked up their ears as soon as we said we're setting a fiction list because... Every agent's got a fiction manuscript to sell, so they got very interested in that. Yes, yeah, so we, we hadn't... Still, even today, a lot of our non-fiction comes direct from authors. In particular, my husband's area of the list, Novi Dustar, he works very much with a list on world religions, on Middle East generally, and on founders of Islam and famous people within Islam, although he's not Muslim himself. But he's very keen to make ideas within Islamic philosophy and relig- and spirituality available to a broader audience. So they're, they're not proselytizing books, but they're very much intellectual books. And so a lot of his authors recommend other authors to come to us. So he, he, he gets most of his books are, are, are still unedited today. We wanted to draw your attention to our crowdfunding page on Patreon. If you've been enjoying Always Take Notes, please do consider supporting us there. It helps us to keep the podcast going. If you support us on Patreon, you can get a great selection of rewards, including a shout out on the show and a selection of successful magazine pitches. Thanks again for supporting Always Take Notes. And we've touched on this a little bit, but you obviously made the leap into publishing fiction in 2009. And you've said you you took the leap at Frankfurt Book Fair in 2008. What was it about about that book fair that, that, that gave you the push that you needed in the right direction? I mean, it was a, it's a form of impatience. We'd, we'd set up a classics list as a joint publishing venture with Alma Books in 2006. And they at that time, they only published fiction and we only published nonfiction. And they were saying, oh, you're so lucky to be publishing nonfiction. It backed us so well and fiction can be a little bit temporary and quite unpredictable, which which is which is which is fairly accurate. And I've always wanted a, to to have a fiction list. You know, I, I read things like, you know, Purple Nabiscus or The Kite Runner or, you know, other books in that sort of area. I mean Lovely Bones, you know, the Rich and Judy program sort of got everybody reading contemporary fiction as well. And having having mainly read more traditional fiction at school, I think I found it very interesting. And I kept saying, oh, if, if we had a fiction list, this is the kind of thing we'd like to do. And I think we, I think my husband was a little nervous about the idea. So in the end, I decided, well, I'm going to Frankfurt. I think I'll start telling people with this on a fiction list and see what happens. And one of the, one of the 
people I met at that Frankfurt in 2008 in October was uh, Claire Roberts, who was the foreign rights director of the Trident Agency. And I described the things I was interested in, you know, things like international fiction, you know, books that have something interesting to say that, that, that really can be very meaningful. And she said, well, I think I've got just a book for you. And it was Marlon James' second novel, which was The Book of Night Women, which is written entirely in pidgin English, set in a Jamaican slave plantation, which to some people might sound tricky, but I think we didn't know enough to be worried about it. I just thought that sounds great. I started reading it. I absolutely fell in love with his prose, which is completely addictive. If you've ever read any of his writing, it's it, it sucks you in straight away. And yeah, I mean, I, I practically bought it on the spot, certainly within a couple of weeks. And we then had the very peculiar experience of then saying to our rep force, which didn't didn't really handle a lot of fiction at the time, and said, well, you know, here we are, we've got this, this manuscript we're publishing, and we were publishing it that autumn. And we had no idea what to expect. And we were very fortunate that the key fiction buyer, Matt Bates at WH Miss Trouble, had a very literary taste and we'd sent him a copy and he absolutely adored it. And he helped us come up with the cover. And a few weeks before it came out, he said to us, oh, um, we're going to put this straight onto the bestseller list. And I went, wow, you know, that's that's a lot of ambition there. You know, I I'm, I was terrified it was going to going we, we, it was the book wasn't going to meet his expectations and then two weeks before publication he said i'm not putting it on the bestsellers i said well you know don't worry i'm i'm sure you're right it's fine you know we we thought that was quite ambitious he said no i'm going to put it on the shelf which you get an entire shelf of just your book which is the book everyone's talking about this week i thought oh my goodness how are we going to live up to that we're going to we're going to have egg all over our face and it it sold and sold and sold and matt bless him put it into every promotion you could think of for the next two years. It was in the six book club picks. It was in the best of the year picks. I mean, he just supported it solidly and he loved it. And when Marlon won the booker and came over, I set up a lunch for them and and I just wanted them to meet because Matt's enthusiasm gave us so much confidence. This is our first venture into fiction and everyone had warned us what a disaster it was going to be or could potentially be and his support meant the world I mean it was just fantastic. What we've often found with um, writers who've had extremely successful books is that we ask them what uh, concatenation of factors led to uh, the success of the book and they find it very difficult to to say or to to try and unpick what had worked. I mean from a publisher's perspective do you you know with your years of experience in the business do you have a sense now of what it takes for a title to really take off maybe what's different in fiction and non-fiction or is there still a, a big element of uncertainty and luck involved i think non-fiction is is much easier to predict because you know whether anyone else is writing on that area you know if the author is qualified to write it uh, the whole submission process is a lot easier it's much less subjective i think with fiction I mean, it's not necessarily that meritocratic because a book can just catch a thermal. It can be the right time, the right place. Somebody can put something on Twitter or BookTok that they love it and it can take off and it can build a momentum. And sometimes somebody might have written a better book on well, a similar subject which just didn't behave like that. So you, you can't always tell. But there are people who said that I I had predicted Marla would win the book with the brief history of Night Women a year before, and I I find that very difficult to believe, but I had two people have said it, so I must have been going around saying it was going to win the book, but I can't now imagine why I would have been that confident, because it's so unpredictable. Prizes are incredibly unpredictable. Um, you know, the judges change every year, and but I knew it would be good. I knew it was important, and I knew he's a very special writer, and I think he's he's got a lot more books in him. He's going to go on and on writing fantastic books, so... I think he's the right person. He might not have been that lucky. I think it, a lot of it is luck, unfortunately. In terms of when you moved into fiction, how did you find the experience of adapting to marketing a different style of book and, and positioning novels versus positioning nonfiction books? I mean, I personally found it quite terrifying because one of the things you want to do as either an editor or a publisher is you want to do the very best job you can and you want to make sure the author has the best chance of success they can. And when you're moving into a new area, particularly from nonfiction to fiction, perhaps less so between 
different areas within nonfiction, but from nonfiction to fiction, you desperately want to do the best you can for that book and for that author. And so, you know, we have had to adapt our, our marketing and publicity. I mean, when we left Oxford in 2011, we had one person in publicity, one in marketing, and we've now got six. So that's very much about building up the team to make sure you can do a good job. And it's absolutely vital, I think. I mean, that you hear stories of, of books that don't quite succeed and they get dropped by publishers and allowed to sort of flounder in no man's land. But I think as a as an individual, you know, I mean, we own the company as well, but I think you, for, speaking just for ourselves, you you really want to publish the way you would like to be published yourself. So I think I would be devastated if I was an author and that happened to me. So I, we, we tried very hard. I mean, you can't control everything. The pandemic obviously was huge and several authors got got damaged by it because if they were if they were published in the early 2020 and sales were poor you know that's that's all their record for life even though we know those records aren't accurate but it it did hurt quite a few people and that's terrible but you you try and do your best and that's all you can do and you you try and adapt you try and learn you you try and absorb information from everywhere you can you you're in bookshops you're reading the trade media you're talking to other publishers you you just try and absorb as much information as you can and that's the way we've always learned is is you know, just trying to be a sponge. Again, on the financial side, how do the advances that you and other independents are able to offer compare to what the, the big corporate firms can do? And is there is there always a, a risk or a fear of, of having authors pinched by a sort of a conglomerate with a big checkbook? I mean, I, I think independents lose authors and staff to the big five, but, and that's that's just, you know, the natural order of things. And it's understandable. And, and there are some things where we feel the risk is too high. We can offer six figures if we are 100% confident of a book. And occasion, very occasionally, I have done it. Although, although luckily, in either case, we won. So that was nice because we didn't have to actually put our money where, where my naughty fingers are. And I terrify my husband sometimes doing that. He, he hates it. But as an accountant especially, you know, he, it's, it's worrying. Uh, and I think a big advance is puts a lot of a lot of stress on everybody. There is a there's a sense among agents that if they can persuade the publisher to put in a big advance, it means that they will therefore put in a big marketing project. And we don't really work like that. Our approach to supporting a book is if a marketing opportunity comes up. I mean, marketing being what you tend to pay for, and publicity tends to be, you know, what's for free. Although that division is changing, obviously, but. If, if we get an opportunity to do some marketing and we think it'll wash its face, even if it's expensive, it's not in the budget for that book, we'll do it because it makes sense on a logical level. If if something's going to, if you're going to put in, you know, 10,000 pounds and it's going to earn you 50,000 pounds, why wouldn't you do it? Not that you ever get exact figures for anything, but so our, our, we we tend to take a, a more flexible approach to these things. If we can If we can do something for a book and it's affordable and it's sensible, then we will do it. But I know I know agents do, and and agents live off the advance. That's that's their main income. So if they're going to get a bigger advance from someone else, you can see why they would. But some authors thrive better in a smaller company. I mean, Matt Haig has been published by the Big Five, and he moved to Canongate, and he's done phenomenally well with Canongate, and he's staying there. So I, I think it would be very unlikely to see him move to another publisher because he's very well looked after. They do everything that he needs done for him, and I don't think he's tempted. So you don't always lose your authors and what have you. Well, that was going to be my next question, actually, about the relationships that you cultivate with your authors. We saw a tweet from one where you had picked her up and, and cooked her dinner at your house, I think it was. Um, how do you go about building those relationships and why do you think it's important to be sort of familiar on, on that level as well as on a professional one? I mean, I had lunch with an author today and I was explaining that um, when her book is finished and you know she's doing she's doing some edits and and it's finally scheduled she'll come in and have tea with the whole company and they get to meet everybody and for me it's important for authors to feel that they have a home that they have a face to put with a name and and since the pandemic obviously we've been doing that on zoom for authors who are abroad but I think coming into the office and having tea and sitting down over a cup of coffee and talking to marketing or talking to publicity or seeing the sales people I mean it's it just makes them feel comfortable. It makes them feel that they're at home. And I think 
if I was an author, I would find it quite intimidating not knowing who's at the, at the end of an email. So that's what we try to do. But individually, I mean, I don't always cook dinner for my authors. I, it's not something I have a habit of doing particularly. You're not, you're not locked into cooking them all dinner, I'm afraid. <laughs> no, no. Well, we've got three authors coming stay with us the same weekend of the Oxford Literary Festival, and they're all coming to our house and they're all going to get fed. So, yeah, but it's not something we always do. But in her case, she was doing an event in Oxford. So I picked her up from the station and put her up and took her there. And so, Cray Mind Guyan, and she's a very special author. She's She puts in 110% for everything she does. So, the very least we could do is cook her a dinner. And what is the division of, of labour and responsibilities between yourself and Naveen, your husband? And how has that, has that changed at all since in the years you've been doing it? Or did you get a kind of system fixed pretty early on? I mean, it's, it's changed a lot because publishing's changed. And our both of us still like editing. And as I say, he has his own list, which is much more academic than mine. Not that that's uh, a sign of seniority, obviously. But I focus now entirely on the fiction list. So I look after my own literary fiction and I also oversee the crime and commercial fiction and the children's list. And he looks after the non-fiction list. So he goes to all the editorial meetings for non-fiction and I don't anymore. He does all the bills, supervises the royalties. That speaks to his own strength. I tend to do more of the networking. I mean, that sounds like a bit of a male-female division, doesn't it? But I think it's just that those are our interests. He's he he still attends conferences in America for Middle East studies and the American Association of Religions. So, you know, he we have some flexibility, but I think we've just adapted as we've gone along. I, I probably take more interest in the publicity and marketing. He takes more interest in sales, but I'm a bit interventionist, I think, with publicity, so I kind of have ideas of my own, so t- tend to discuss them with publicity marketing. So I think he's got very good judgment. So not on not on fiction books, but um, generally he's got very good head on his shoulders. So I think it, it would be very hard to run an independent publishing company on your own unless you've got a good backup, I think. So for us, it's been very helpful having the two of us. And obviously we bring work home and talk about work in the evenings and weekends. So for some people that sounds horrendous, but it's the way we've always done it. That was what I also wanted to ask was whether you ever have any days off or, or holidays. I, I imagine running your own business must be very rewarding, but also pretty all-consuming. It's tricky. I mean, it took me a while to realize that the best time to take off is Christmas because you don't, you're not right, you're not spending three hours every morning catching up with emails because most other people are off. So we try to take a week or 10 days off at Christmas. We're not terribly good at booking holidays, mainly because we don't get round to it. You know, we're the sort of people who, who go online to see if we can fly somewhere on a Saturday and it's a Friday night. You know, it's a, it's a, it tends to be impulsive. But this year we were forced to take a week skiing in January, which is unusual. Last year, I think we had a week off the whole year. So I think this year looks very promising. I think we might have another holiday in the summer. But yeah, it's difficult because even if we are on holiday or if we are in New York meeting agents and publishers, we're... You know, we still spend half the day catching up with emails and then and then get on with the holiday or our our meeting. So, you know, I, th- I think it is tricky. I think I think it, if we weren't married, we'd probably take it in turns to take time off. And I think the fact that if we go off together, we 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 both out the office makes it a little bit more difficult. I'm sure other people do much better than we do, or or are much less engaged in the day to day running of the company than we are. Another point that's been discussed in the the non-fiction landscape in the UK in recent years is is books taking on controversial topics and attracting kind of attacks from lawyers and stuff like that, particularly with, you know, the books written about oligarchs and so forth. How have you had experience with that? And as an independent publisher, what's it like kind of fending off attack compared to being in a big corporate firm? We've we've had it twice. We, We published a book about Chinese interference in British politics written by two Australian journalists, very, very well researched. And we had several attempts to take us to court. And each time they produced very detailed responses and eventually went away. But we, we that cost us probably about £10,000, which is not terrible. But that's £10,000 on the profitability of that book. So that's quite a challenge. 
I wouldn't say we've had really serious problems. We published a book which went on to win the Orwell Prize uh, last year about Grenfell. And the author was subject to several legal attacks during the writing of it, to the point where at one point he cancelled the contract. His mental health was really challenged. And he was, it was when the court case was going on and he was covering it on a, on a daily basis. And these attacks to try and stop him publishing his book was such that in the end he gave up. And then we cancelled the project, and obviously, and then a few months later he came and says, no, I really got to publish it. And for that, we needed to take out legal insurance. And we approached a couple of law firms through an intermediary. And I think the, the bill was originally, the, the first suggestion was something like six figures. But the second firm that was approached turned out to be the firm that was already involved in, in the actual legal cases involving Grenfell. And because they knew the, the legal side back, backwards, they I think they gave us something ridiculous like £2,000 <laughs> to give us a, the, the, the coverage because they knew how solid the cases were. And um, so we were able to publish with a lot more confidence. But it is worrying. And I think there is a, the, I know the Publishing Association is very keen to stop these slaps because, and they've talked to the government about it because we're seen as the, as the, easy option. So if we co-publish with an American publisher, they go after the British publisher because our legal situation is better. In America, the person wanting to bring the case has to prove their case. But in our situation, we have to defend ourselves. So it's a it's a much more vulnerable situation from a legal point of view for non-fiction publishers. And as we're coming towards the end of our time, a final question from me is how it's worked with launching new imprints, particularly for children and young adults, and also your academic and book club fiction lists. How have they kind of fitted into the one world I don't know, empire? I don't know. <laughs> Family? Um, well, I wanted to do, I wanted to publish big children's books when our children were young and they're now in their uh, late 30s and early 40s. But I think we just felt we weren't in a good place to go in that direction. We didn't really know enough about the market. And I think having published fiction for a while, I felt that it wasn't such a big leap. And so we we set about trying to find an editor to come on board to help. And it was we were very fortunate that my daughter, who decided for reasons best known to herself to go into TV journalism rather than publishing, had had just finished her her work and had come in to help us with some marketing because we were in between marketeers. And she seemed the ideal person with young children herself to come in and, and help us. So we had one or two other editors briefly, but she's been a really solid, a really solid editor to, to guide that ship. And we've now got another to join her. And, and they, seem to, they seem to produce some really successful books. I mean, we've been very lucky. I mean, Booktop was a huge help. We, we published a book now about six years ago that has sold about 12,000 copies by... I think it was by September 2020 and Book Talk started and it it sold out one day and we we reprinted 3,000. It sold out like a few days later. We think, oh, hang on a minute, that's a bit strange. And of course, we we didn't really know what Book Talk was. And I think a lot of people at the time were quite quite new. And it's now published, about, it's now print, we've now printed about 600,000 copies. So it's gone from 12,000 to 600,000, largely thanks to TikTok. So, so those sort of things are helpful. But it is always a little bit worrying starting a new list and you've got to look after them and you've got to find the right people. And I think for small companies, finding the right people is the biggest challenge because in a big company, you can offer spot somebody in another imprint who's ready to move up or across and you can move move talent like that. But for a small company, you've always got to reach out and find it and it's not always that easy. A lot of people like to work in big companies, but the people here and a lot of people here stay you know, 10, 15 years, they... They rather like the stability and the the social sociableness of a small company. It's more intimate, but but the pros and cons are both, and it's up to the individual what they prefer. And a, a final question from me, um, coming back to the Booker Prize where we started. What what's your view on the opening of the prize up to non-British authors? I mean, obviously Paul Beatty, as you say, was an American winner, but what do you think of the, the pros and cons of that decision? I mean, it had always been open to the Commonwealth, which is a rather anachronistic kind of grouping really so so if you would connect i mean so so Marlon james was eligible before because he's jamaican so canadians and australians and indians and 
half of Africa were already eligible. But I know it was very controversial at the time, and the Booker Prize insisted it was nothing to do with the fact that the folio was considering launching a prize that was for English language by authors from anywhere in the world. And I think the timing of them changing might have been to do with that, but I know they had been discussing it on and off for a few years beforehand. I think what it's done for the prize is it's made it, probably along with the Pulitzer, the preeminent prize in English language literature in the world, because the American prizes are largely not eligible. You know, you're not eligible for them if you if you're not an American citizen or resident. So I think by opening it to anybody anywhere, it has raised the standard. Not the standard. That's not fair because there are, you know, it doesn't matter how big the catchment area, you'll always find the best six or the best author, I think. But I know that the time some people were saying even the Americans aren't happy because they like the discoverability of British authors for their market. They can then go and buy them up and big them up in their own market. But personally, I think it was a, you know, I, I wasn't that familiar with the prize beforehand. And we'd been, we were long listed in 2011 with a black British London author. But so I wasn't really that familiar with the prize, but it seemed to me it makes sense if you want to be the big prize. And I think the sponsors possibly, I mean, I'm speaking out of turn really, but I think the sponsors might've had a little bit to do with it because they were an international company. And it suited them as well to build their profile in America. But I don't think that's the reason it was done. But yeah, I mean, I know a lot of people aren't happy about it even today. I'm not sure that's the note we should end on. But anyway, (laughs) thank you very much, Juliet, for your time and wishing you the best with all of your books and projects going forward. Thank you very much for having me. And it's been lovely to meet you both. That was the Always Take Notes interview with Juliet Maybe. You can find her on Twitter at Jewel9 and you can find more about Profit Song and the rest of One World Stable at oneworld-publications.com. Hello, it's us again. Simon, what was your takeaway from the interview with Juliet? I thought it was one of the most interesting publisher interviews that we've done actually on the show. I mean, she's had this incredible uh, run of form with with uh, Booker Prizes, which we got her right on the back of. And I thought, you know, someone really well-placed and interesting to talk about how the publishing landscape has developed. Um, as we alluded to at the top of the episode, the difference between large corporates and independents. And then also, you know, this idea that because it is essentially her own operation um that she is able to kind of exercise her taste in a way that might not be possible elsewhere and that that's had um really extraordinary results and uh, what about you Rachel yeah we didn't really get into the balance sheets but I found it interesting when reading interviews with her that her lack of focus or professed lack of focus on profit means she can take those editorial risks um I also enjoyed listening to Juliet discuss the influence of Charles Dickens on her own reading tastes and her perception of fiction's potential to change minds. Um, She was quite persuasive, I thought, on the merits of worthiness and and fiction's ability to discuss social issues in a nuanced way, um, using characters to embody different perspectives and and facets of an argument and so on. Um, I also thought it was interesting to hear the the influence of WH Smith in creating a hit, which we hadn't touched on that much um, in the past. Anyway, what have you been up to, Simon? I'm in the Alps of doing... uh two days of training with my team for the race. And I had, um, this is very niche, but I had a minor triumph today in that uh, we were experimenting using these extremely lightweight skis that you have to use for ski mountaineering racing. Um, And there was a question mark as to whether I could use the extremely lightweight one. So I had to have like a a remedial pair that was slightly wider and it turned out I was okay to use the extremely lightweight ones. So this may sound niche, but for me, this was a vast (laughs) personal triumph that I want to share with with the listeners. So yeah, so it's been... uh, been kind of fairly demanding but I, I came back to the UK for a couple of weeks and which was great and had a chance to um, decompress and recharge I'm now in the sort of final stretch here which seems slightly surreal because it's I'm actually I'm back in a, in a tiny little high altitude village called the roller where I was two years ago right at the start of the project and it, yeah it's slightly bizarre that it's now touch wood almost um, at an end and in, in matters cultural, again, almost the only cultural thing I've absorbed has been this week's episode of Masters of the Air, which I thought was weak. 
I have to say. You've also been sending me updates um, from, uh, not updates, sort of dispatches and thoughts on the Six Nations documentary. You're quite haunted by the by the, the characters in it. By, well, mostly by their ears, Rachel, which I'm, I'm frankly traumatised by. Um, particularly that guy who plays for Ireland, where he shows sort of one extremely deformed protrusion from the side of his head and then says like this is my good ear believe it or not <laughs> but i thought um i i thought it was i think we, we discussed this movie off air but it's very i think that stuff is very compelling tv even if you don't know that much about the sport actually well you do wonder a bit whether these like you know character pairings that they create in each episode are slightly can be kind of slightly mm. contrived you know i wonder if they have to interview everyone before every game and then they pick out the person that is that has the kind of most relevance yeah, oh, yeah. I kind of, I, I, I wondered as well. Like, is this stuff all in the can? Do they have these like deep, you know, emotive background or interviews with literally the entire squad, or do they just write some people off as you know definitely not TV worthy at an early stage? Well, there's um an interesting story from filming the reality TV TV version of Squid Game in that it had 400 odd participants. They had to interview all of them because they had no idea who was going to succeed. So apparently, it was a logistical nightmare. The other thing I thought about that actually is that, you know, with reality TV, my understanding is like the usual rule is that everyone is in a sort of quest to get maximum screen time. And that the easiest way to do that is to like throw massive tantrums, behave quite badly and everything like that. That that I thought was like the the sort of Marxist interpretation of why there are these massive tantrums on Real Housewives, for instance, because that's the easiest. Everyone is fighting for screen time. But I suppose if it is relating to a sport, then... The rules are slightly mm. different. The, uh, they're filming, I think, the second season at the minute. And I don't know if you watched the France-Italy game, but Italy could and should have won in the last kick of the game. But the uh, kicker hit the post. So I already know he's going to be the focus of that episode. It's going to be about how you manage under pressure. I, I thought the the French coach was oh, he's hilarious. An outstanding, mm. an outstanding. Like the, the fact that he used the word arabesque and also parabola to describe the the way that le french flair very interesting um anyway uh, this has been a long tangent at the end of always take notes hosted by me simon akam and me rachel lloyd our producer and social media editor is artemis Irvin. our score is by jess danheiser and our graphic design is by james edgar if you'd like to follow us on social media we're on instagram at always take notes on twitter at take notes always if you'd like to support us on our crowdfunding page on Patreon, we're on there under Always Take Notes. And if you'd like to leave a review on iTunes or get in touch with us via our website, please do. Many thanks. Goodbye.